guys that, uh, Yes, first of all, we are recording this session. A lot of people told us at the last minute they couldn't make it and asked if we could record it for them. So hopefully that's okay with you. Uh, if you don't wanna be on camera for that recording, you know, feel free to, to close your camera. Um, sorry if uh, the, the assignments of breakout rooms was a little chaotic, there was a little bouncing around, but hopefully you had a little time to talk about some of the things that made your exceptional training experiences so good and your not so good experiences, not so good. So tell us in the chat first, um, what made those trainings that you remember as good? What were some of those characteristics, those features that made them so good? <clears throat> Hi, I'm m and um, Did you wanna write that in the chat or speak verbally? You can go ahead and speak verbally or write it in the chat. Sure. One um one thing that I said is that I liked trainings that were um customized to like the audience at hand and visually engaging. And then um someone on, on our team also said that um inclusivity was important. So if there are more introverted people in the room, giving them an opportunity to voice their opinions also mattered to us. Sure. Thank you so much. I'm also seeing Bella saying the printer, the presenter is engaging and authentic. John says the objectives are stated in the beginning. Chantal also talked about that inclusivity. There's engagement, says Tiffany, solid stories and discussions, participatory, relevant to the learners, says Sarah. James says good feedback from the learners. Yeah, ability to apply what you've learned interactive. So there's really a theme here of participatory and interactive. Someone else says objectives are clear and discussed. Storytelling is mentioned a few times. Really wonderful things are, are um, listed in the chat if you haven't had a chance to scroll through and look those over. I'm going to ask, I'm going to put a line in the chat here and ask you to flip your thinking to what made some of those worst trainings not as good. Too much content, says Sarah. Absolutely, trying to squeeze too much in. Julia, compulsory information that I could have read in an email. Michael says, someone droning on with lots of slides, no sense of the audience and their needs. Yeah, so Bella says it's not applicable. Um, yeah, a lot of, a couple of you are pointing out slides that have, are so dense that really what do what do we all need to be here for if we're just going to be reading these or having the instructor read them to us um no no opportunity to practice because of that overload of content that not engaging content okay you can continue to put those thoughts in there but i want to thank you for participating in our best and worst warm-up and i had promised you that i would share with you some of the other logistics you need to know about our time together this evening. This is our agenda. We are going to talk about um, our objective for tonight and create some norms for this learning space. We're gonna do an activity. Some of you are my former students and have done this, learned this activity, but uh, you'll have a chance to, to try it out again. And then we'll, we'll use that activity to pull out some adult learning principles and we'll do an exercise to put it all together. Uh, there's a lot we need to cover, and we're covering it at a very high level. I mean, basically, we're doing in an hour um, content that comes from a course that's 24 hours. So this is really just I'm scratching the surface. Um, but there will be an optional Q&A after the hour is done. I could not fit it into the to the hour, but I will stay around for as as long as you have questions. So that's our agenda. Um, for those who don't already know me, uh, I'm Sophie Oberstein. Hello, welcome. I have been in the field of learning and development for over 25 years. I've been teaching an NYU's learning design certificate program for about eight years. I currently teach both of the required courses in the, in the uh, certificate program, Fundamentals, which is where tonight's content comes from, and Practices. Uh, my latest book, Troubleshooting for Trainers, describes 45 common challenges that trainers might face with solutions for addressing them. 
So um, my bio and my contact information are both available in the handouts that, Renee, I guess we have not sent yet. We will send afterwards. Right. So um, after tonight's session, you'll get a packet and it will include all of the content from the slides. So don't worry. You don't need to be writing things down madly because you will get all of this information afterwards. So you can really sit back and fully participate. As far as introducing yourselves, uh, we don't have time to do that for everyone, but you certainly should um, make sure you're happy with the name that's on Zoom. If you want to change your uh, to your chosen name or nickname, put in the pronunciation of your name, add your pronouns. Um, at this point, almost all of us are probably familiar with how to use Zoom, but to do that, you would um, hover over your name in the participants list where it says more, you would find an option for rename or just go to the top right-hand corner of your video portion and three little dots will appear. If you click on those, you can bring up an option to rename yourself as well. But I also have two questions for you to respond to. Um, we're gonna use these reaction tools tonight a couple of times. Um, so we're gonna respond to these two questions with a yes or no by using reactions. To do that, you hover at the bottom of your screen, we're the same place you get to chat, um, and you find reactions and there's a green check or a red X. So we'll use those to respond to this question. I have taken one of Sophie's learning design certificate courses at NYU SPS. Give us a green check if yes, red X if no. If you cannot find the checks or don't have them in your version of Zoom, you can always put a yes or a no into the chat. All right, so thank you for those red X's and those green checks. About 20 of you have not been with me before. Two of you have. Um, welcome back to my students. If you are willing and able to stay for the Q&A at the end of the evening, maybe you can talk about your experience in the certificate program for those who are interested. So please um, do, do um, consider that if you're one of my former students. I'm gonna clear your answers to that question because I have one more question. Um, do you currently work in the field of learning and development? Give a, a green check if yes, red X if no. I currently work in the field of learning and development. Yeah, so most of you, about two thirds of you do, um, several of you don't. And people come to this certificate program for a variety of reasons. They want to get into the field. They have people that they need to train in their own fields. They don't have a trainer role, but they are still working with adult learners. And sometimes we get people who have been doing this work for some time, for a number of years, but who just never got the training and the fundamentals, never got the vocabulary, the models, the theory. And they come to this program to kind of validate their instincts which they have been relying on uh, for, for most of their, their time. No matter your role, there's gonna come a time when you will need to teach someone else a job skill or some related performance knowledge. And strategies for teaching adults in the workplace differ from those that we experienced as students in school. And tonight we'll notice some ways that that is true. We have only one objective for our time together. That's all we can accomplish. I hope you will be able to identify at least one adult learning principle that you can apply in your next session with adult learners. And maybe you already use a lot of them. So maybe it's just recommitting to one of them, or maybe it's you use a lot of them, but there's always more that you can add to your toolkit. So hopefully you will walk away with at least one adult learning principle that you can apply in your next session with learners. I have four requests for this hour in order to create an environment where you can do your best learning. Um, please participate fully with a group of our size. Um, it, that may or may not mean speaking, although I, I would love to have you raise your hand and, and participate as, as much as you are moved to do so. Um, but certainly in using these polls that I'll be using, these, these nonverbal reactions, these chats. So please do that <laughs> fully. Um, 
Confidentiality is, is always a key for a safe learning environment. Um, trying to refrain from multitasking, it's really hard to do that, especially when we're in our own home space and there's so much going on, but um, multitasking is actually a neuro myth. It is impossible <laughs> to do more than one thing at a time and to actually do them both well. So, you know, the more you can focus, the better. And um, being gracious with technological hiccups. Hopefully we will not have any tonight because I put a wire, my, 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 my internet is, my internet connection was, has been unstable for a week. So I'm now wired. There's a wire going through my entire upstairs. So hopefully I will not have technological uh, glitches. You may have them. And if so, just, you know, don't worry, dial back in, they'll all work. Um, Give a green check if you are in agreement with these four things for our remaining time together. Red X if you need clarity or have any concerns. Thank you for those green checks coming in. Okay. So I just took up a reasonable amount of time with these things, especially for a one hour session. I'd love if you would raise a hand or put into chat your thoughts about why we do all this. Why do we do icebreakers and logistics and objectives and agreements and agendas? If you don't know how to use the raise hand function, which we'll, we'll kind of use so we don't all talk on top of each other, it's in that same area of reactions. And instead of the green check and red X, it's a raised hand. So raise a hand or put in chat. Why do we spend time at the beginning of our sessions on all this stuff? Edwin says you can build connection with your participants. Absolutely. Tiffany. I think that like when you're doing a training or people are learning, like people want, you need them to be open. And so doing icebreakers, having these conversations helps build trust and connection, no matter how short like the engagement is. Yeah. So to build some rapport, to build trust, to make people feel like, oh, I, I think that what I say here is going to be contained here. My opinion is going to be respected. There's a confidentiality ground rule for that. So yeah, it helps people feel feel safe and comfortable. Um, Edwin says, establishing ground rules to get a gauge of what people are interested in. Dawn says, level the playing field. Dawn, you wanna say, elaborate on that for a moment? What do you mean by level the playing field? Just, it, it kind of, it, it's it in line with what everyone else is saying. It lets everyone know what the ground rules are and allows access. And it doesn't assume that anybody knows something more than even just giving us a framework of where to find tools. You're assuming that we all need to, to have that so that, you know, there's no inside people who know this and people who don't know this. So we all feel included. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm seeing really nice comments in the chat about establishing boundaries, getting buy-in, creating a safe environment for people to get engaged and involved, um, being clear upfront what everyone should expect. So thank you for those ideas. I think you actually touched on all the ideas I had, I had come up with and more. Um, it allows for just a shared understanding. It also gives people a moment to transition from whatever it was that they were doing before they got here to being present and focused on the session now. Um, people live, like, leave busy lives and are rushing from place to place. So to slow down for a moment and say, hey, let's talk about what we expect from one another. Let's talk about what we're doing tonight. It just grounds people, um, connects people, as you said, to one another, to content, and most importantly, creates that safe learning environment so that learners can take risks, make mistakes, ask stupid questions. Um, so yeah, I, I did want to um, demonstrate those things and then talk about why we do them because through this workshop tonight and through all of the classes in the certificate program, we really are trying to kind of lift the curtain like the Wizard of Oz to show what's going on behind the scenes. Why did you make this choice to do this sort of um, exercise or this sort of activity? Why did you choose to start this way, et cetera? So it's, it's also just kind of giving you some transparency. But 
Now I want to do an exercise to really see if we can identify some, some qualities of or some adult learning principles. And it's a learn this exercise. This is a session on adult learning. You're adults, so I think we should dive right in and learn something. Uh, for this exercise, you should have a paper and writing utensil handy, but don't write anything until I ask you to do so. So I'm gonna pause for 10 seconds because surprisingly people don't always have a pen nearby. All right, so you have a paper and pencil, paper and utensil handy. Don't use it right now. I'm going to ask you to learn something. And it's this sequence of numbers. And I'm gonna give you 60 seconds to learn this 18 digit sequence in order. Do not write anything down. Don't write anything down. Your 60 seconds has begun. You have 10 more seconds. All right, so now you have 30 seconds to write down all 18 digits in order. I'm going to give you one more opportunity to learn this sequence, but this time I'll give you a hint. These numbers stand for something, and the first one is indicating how many seasons are in a year, four, and then there are 12 months in a year. Raise a hand, or actually don't even raise a hand, just come off mute and call it out or put into the chat if you can tell me what the next number probably stands for. 52 weeks in a year. 52 weeks in a year, then. Seven days in a week. Seven days in a week, yep. 24 hours in a day. 24 hours in a day. 60, 60 minutes, minutes in an hour. hour. 60 minutes in an hour. And then 60 minutes, seconds minute. 60 seconds in a minute. And then what are the rest of the numbers? How many days in a month? How many days in, in various months? 30, 31, or 28. Okay, so I'm now going to give you 60 seconds once again to learn this sequence. Don't write anything down. You have 10 more seconds. Okay, and now you have 30 seconds to try and recreate the list.
So give a green check if you did better the second time compared to the first time. Give a red X if you did better the first time compared to the second time. Green check if you did better the second time. Red X if you did better the first time, because as you can see, a few people do do better the first time. However, it usually is a majority of people, as it is here, that do do better the second time. Why is that? And Gabriella, we'll get to you in a moment. You got it right the first time. We'll figure out how you did that in a moment. Um, James, what do you mean by chunking? By combining the uh, the numbers into groups that you can relate to in another way, chunking the learning uh, into those separate pieces, you're able to recall them easier. Right, so instead of just 18 random numbers, we chunked them, we put them into nine chunks instead of 18 random numbers. That was less to remember. And as you said, there was some context to those chunks that we created. So absolutely, there was some, some chunking going on, context as Naja says. Um, Evan, we'll talk about mnemonics in a little bit. This is not, ex well, maybe this isn't, yeah, this could be a mnemonic because a mnemonic is a memory trick and we gave you some memory tricks. Um, it's not exactly what we have in mind, but it, it, it could count. Um, yeah, Bella's saying even the first time chunked the numbers together like a credit card. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so we got context, we got chunking, um, we got, um, you, you also are building on your prior knowledge because you'd done this before. This was the second time you did it. You'd had some practice in a sense. It wasn't a good practice necessarily, but it was um, the second time you had done it. So there was prior exposure. Also about that context, who provided the context? Did I tell you what all of the numbers stood for? I'm sure if we were all off mute, you'd be saying, no, I had you do that. I had you think about it. Now, to some of you who did better the first time, maybe you, like Sarah, said, I had my own weird pattern that worked better for me. So. I um, started you off with some hints, but I didn't go through all of the numbers. I had you try and come up with the actual hints yourself, come up with those yourself. And in this case, we all kind of came up with them together, but some of you for the even the first round came up with your own system. So it was about um, coming up with something yourself that was actually quite key to um, quite key to your remembering this. Okay. Why did we do that? Why did we do that exercise in a workshop on adult learning principles? You can raise a hand, you can put us in, put it in chat. Why do you think we did that exercise? To learn by doing. Bella says the importance of scaffolding, the importance of building of what we know. Right, so it was a chance to demonstrate what scaffolding actually could feel like. What It was a reminder, as Evan says, that simply giving people information is not enough. Helene says maybe showing different learning styles that some people like to do it themselves and figure it out themselves. Other people liked to work together to figure it out. Michael said it's a demonstration of how to engage students, of med metacognitive thinking, how to get students to start filling in parts. Julia says it was an experiential process, right? So I could have just come out here and told you, hey, you know, adult learning works better when people have, when, when you chunk the content. Adult learning works better when you make it relevant to them or give them a context. But instead of my just telling you that, we did it through an experiential process. So we both, I made some points about adult learning without having to make points exactly. Also, it was just an illustration of the idea that I'm trying to get you to learn the same content in two different ways, and one of them is more effective than the other. 
which just shows you that there are some ways that are more effective and some ways that are less effective. And also wanted to get you engaged with the content, grab your, grab your attention. So we have started to actually highlight some adult learning principles through that exercise. And now we're going to articulate them a little bit more. And we're gonna do that through uh, three statements. For each of the statements, I'll ask you if you believe they are true or false using again, the green check for yes, agree, uh, green check for agree, red X for disagree. So here's number one, adults learn best by listening to experts in their field. Green check if you agree, red X if you disagree. All right, and a couple of you um, agree with that statement. Um, many of you disagree with that statement. The, the problem with that statement and the reason that the two of you who agree with it um, aren't, aren't exactly correct is, is mostly this word best. Adults learn best by listening to experts in the field. Adults do learn um, by listening to experts in their field, but they don't learn best that way. That's one of the things that sets adult learning theory apart from how we've traditionally taught children. Now, these terms, pedagogy and andragogy, have evolved over time. Pedagogy once did mean the traditional instruct, well, the traditional kind of way we taught children in school settings, formal elementary type school settings, and andragogy meant adult learning. But it's more broad than that because now we really are trying to teach everyone more on this andragogy side because the difference is really pedagogy is. is instructor focused and andragogy is learner focused. And in the pedagogical approach, the traditional uh, theory and practice of teaching, you, you would think that experts teaching was the experts sharing their knowledge was the, was the right way to go, the best way to go, because the trainer is seen as the primary resource for providing examples and solutions. Whereas in an adult learning or an andragogical or a learner-centered approach, participants are seen as the primary resources for examples and solutions. So it's not about um, adult learners sitting back and being passive learners and having someone just dump their knowledge on them. It's not about um, them being empty vessels who don't come in with a wealth of knowledge and experience of their own that we need to tap into. So what we are looking for when we work with adult learners is um, assuming that they have the best examples and solutions, that their involvement is vital to success, that we need to use active training methods, that our objectives are flexible and can be customized for our individual group. And we can also influence, you know, they can also influence the timing and pace of our programs. And also we want to make sure that, that that learning is real life problem centered. That word that you came up with several times when you were talking about the best workshops you've ever been to was relevant, applicable. Um, so real life problem centered. Um, feel free to tell us in the chat or raise a hand. Which of the principles on the andragogy side are you currently utilizing in your trainings if you are designing trainings? If you're not designing trainings, but you've been to, a, been to some workshops, what have you noticed in terms of which one of these uh, learner-centered practices have you noticed? Michael gets a lot of student and participant perspective into his teaching. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Sarah says, making that learning real life problem centered. Bella says, including their involvement. And also that, that one I didn't talk about at the top, you know, just even calling our participants participants as opposed to students, because students puts them back in the mindset of grammar school and brings up some, some uh, uh, feelings for them or memories for them that they may not want to remember. So um, thank you for that. 
James, relevant problem-centered uh, workshops, participant involvement, fantastic. Whoop, I have someone disagreeing. I wanna look and see, tend to disagree, at least teaching at NYU, NYU SPS grad students who don't always have as much as you hope to contribute in terms of professional experience. Um, yeah, there are still, even if they don't have as much experience coming in, active training methods for conveying the knowledge that you have. And you, yes, you know, you come to N NYU as a grad student, you're gonna have a professor who probably has expertise and, and knows a lot more than you do, hopefully, um, but that doesn't impart that um, as sort of the, the expert, the sage on a stage, as they say, more the person who involves people and helps them to come to that, um, to that knowledge through some participatory and interactive exercises. So, um, Michael, I know that you tended to disagree. Is that little thumbs up there yours? Is that explanation working for you? Yeah, I, I like your explanation. I think that there are, I mean, clearly there are active methods to draw students in. And at SBS, we work very hard to be, you know, the, the guide from the side and not the stage from the stage. Um, but I think what's challenging is if you're teaching, teaching a group of students who really don't have a lot of experience that they can contribute, you know, with respect to managing a marketing team or working in a marketing team, you know, so you're trying to teach them something that they don't have experience with. So sometimes, I mean, you can call on them as consumers and individuals and humans and all of that, but uh, sometimes you have to revert a little bit to you know, content, um, you know, yeah. not regurgitation, but you know, you're, you're, you're doing more training than you are drawing them out. So they, to the, the condition it wouldn't meet is that um, learners, what did you say? Learners the primary have resources. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that is not true in a large amount of the training we're doing. Fair, that's very fair. Um, and I heard you say, that's the thing on the list that you can't do. And there still are some things on the list that you can do. You can let them influence yeah. timing and pace. Like if you need to slow down to catch up some of people or go faster because they're getting it really well or you know, make it centered around a problem that they have. So yes, I hear you. I agree with you that maybe not all of these apply in the SPS um, faculty context. Thank you. All right, question number two. Let me just, did I clear all your old, let me clear your old feedback. Uh, adult learners need to know why they need to learn something. All right, so far we are pretty unanimous that that is um, the case and have one question. Uh, I was, oh no, that was just a, okay, that was a check. Yeah, so we're pretty unanimous about adult learners need to know why they need to learn something. And that is indeed one of the principles of Malcolm Knowles, who is a pioneer in the area of adult learning. These are some of the main tenets of his research into adult learners in the early 1970s, that um, they need to know how relevant this is, how applicable it is for them. They need the WIFM. Does anyone want to tell us what WIFM stands for? What's in it for me? What's in it for me? Yes, I always say adult learners' favorite radio station is WIIFM. What's in it for me? Um, we really want to build in the benefits to them right off the bat so that they understand why it's relevant. Also, learner, adult learners come in seeing, seeing themselves as self-directed, responsible grown-ups and want to be treated as grown-ups. Um, they bring a wealth of knowledge and skill, and we want to really tap into that. They have a great deal to contribute. Um, and Malcolm Knowles says that adult learners have a, an interest, a readiness, an investment to learn what will help them cope efficiently with their daily life. And similarly, they're willing to devote energy to learning things that they believe will help them to solve a problem. Yeah, and Helene's question is exactly what I was getting at before. Um, 
these were put out there in the 70s as adult learning principles, and they're great principles for all learners, regardless of their age. So yes, shouldn't all learners get a what's in it for me? Absolutely. Um, anyone who wishes can put in the chat, which one of these things is most true for you as an adult learner? When you're in an adult learning situation, which of these is really the most important to you? That we keep it relevant, that we tap into your experience, that we have a problem orientation. That readiness, yeah, you're, you feel like when you go in and you know it's gonna help you. Yep, Evan, I need that with him or I'm lost. Chantal says that readiness to learn, fantastic. All right, in the interest of time, we have one more statement. Um, let me clear your old answers. Techniques like repetition and memorization are the most effective when trying to move information from short-term to long-term memory. And this one may be a little harder to answer. I'm introducing some concepts that you may or may not even be familiar with yet at the moment. Um, and you, you just may not know the answer. So I am going to uh, give you a quick rundown on this one. Um, bulk of you have said that's not the case. Um, and, and you're correct. Um, first of all, you need to know that the goal is to move content from short-term memory to long-term memory. We need knowledge and skills to be remembered if they're going to be used. Short-term memory is not a place. It's just a processing center. That's why it's also called the working memory, because that's what it does. It's working. It's processing. It's not holding anything. Whereas the long-term memory is where information gets stored. It has an unlimited capacity and it's where we put that information. So repetition and rote memorization are techniques that, that can work, but don't have the sticking power of some of these other strategies for moving information from short to long-term memory, which by the way, is often referred to as encoding. So, in our course, we talk about many of the ways of doing that, but we're going to focus tonight on just a couple of these that I want to highlight, some of which we've already spoken about a bit, chunking, spacing, connecting to prior knowledge, and mnemonics. So mnemonics has been talked about and chunking as well. Chunking, as we said, refers to the strategy of consolidating information into bite-sized pieces so the brain can more easily digest it. The reason the brain needs this assistance is because working memory, which is where we manipulate information, has a small capacity and a very short duration. Chunks can help reduce the load on that working memory. So instead of processing 18 numerals, we only have to process nine chunks of numerals. Or in this case, is this number here on the screen one item or three? Is two, one, three, one item or three? Put in the chat whether you, you see this as one item or three. Ah, so the people who are saying it's one item, how come? It's easier to remember it as a sequence instead or as a chunk instead of three separate numbers. Well, it's easier to do that, but actually, some people actually know this as one chunk because they know it is the area code for Los Angeles. If you know this is the area code for Los Angeles, that's one thing you have to remember, one chunk. You've already put it together. If you don't know that, this might still appear as um, three separate digits. So chunking is why, as someone said earlier, phone numbers, social security numbers, credit card numbers get grouped. It makes them easier to remember than a random string of numbers. We've talked a lot about numbers here. Not all of us are training other people in numbers, but the, the pearl of wisdom here is that if a learner's working memory is full, 
the excess information is just going to drop out. It's just going to disappear. And that's a big challenge for a trainer, for a course designer. It means that if you're explaining something complex, you need to chunk that information into bite-sized pieces. Another principle that affects the strong pathways into long-term memory is called the spacing effect. The spacing effect is the tendency for long-term memory to be increased when learning events get spaced over time. There's greater retention when people are exposed to a topic more frequently in shorter timeframes and extended over a long period of time. This graphic just shows it in a, in a, in a silly-ish way. Um, some math students were given an experiment where some of them studied for four long hours in a row, kind of crammed their studying together, resulting in a C grade, whereas other people studied in chunks with space in between. Literally all they had was time in between their sessions and it contributed more towards their, their higher grades. How much time is recommended between learning, between learning events? I basically heard that the longer the period between practices, between content chunks, the longer overall retention, at least over a couple of days. And there is some benefit actually in sleeping in between your learning reinforcements. Helene says, is that the same material in each chunk? No, it, it's not necessarily the same material in each chunk. So we're not talking about repetition or practice here. We're literally saying, as you introduce content, have space in between. The, long, the more space you can put in between your, your content. So if this, is, if this is your full module is four hours, you could offer it once as a four hour, it's not gonna be as effective as doing it in half hour chunks over time. Now, there is many, many reasons why we can't do our training that way um, always, but it is, it is something that helps with encoding. I see there's something in the chat. I'm gonna just run through this and then I'll go back to that. Um, another of the encoding principles I wanted to highlight tonight is connecting to prior knowledge. Uh, one way to transfer information from short to long-term memory is making that information meaningful in some way, as we did sort of in a mini version in our exercise. And the easiest way to do this is to connect new information with something that's already well-known. Learning is stickier when we attach new learning to something people already know. Often that is done, one way that is done is through metaphors, like the trainer, the reason there's a picture of a hiking book here, um, a trainer I know does a workshop on change management and connects each aspect of change management to getting ready for and going on a hike. So people kind of understand that you pack your bag, you get a map, you plan your route. And so she relates all of that to um, all of her change management course to that. Um, would that be a reason to have prerequisites for a class? Oh, Helene, that's such a good question. And there's so many answers to that. So um, it has a little bit to do with spacing because I can space out the learning by having a prerequisite and then having a course. Um, it has a little bit to do with prior knowledge because I would then have given some people prior knowledge. Um, but it also has a lot of other good reasons that I just do not have time to share with you this evening. Let me just go back and see. Uh, I'm not sure I'm understanding. Oh, cat naps in between training sessions at work. <laughs> Believe it or not, that, that could help with learning. Um, I have worked at companies where there's been a nap room and maybe for good reason. Um, wait, let's see. Uh, short term, sorry, my chat is just not behaving very nicely. Uh, I'm trying to see Michael's. On short-term memory and working memory, there's an interesting belief that the number of chunks you can hold in working memory is seven plus or minus two. And, and more recent research says it's four, four items. Um, but the size of the item can be different. So a, a lot, there's, there's so much to this that I'm not gonna be able to. Evan says, if a learner wants to do everything at once, is a good idea to force spacing on them for their own good. Um, I think you have to balance a little bit treating them as adults and um, their prior knowledge and their motivation based on, you know, whether they think this is going to help them solve a problem, whether they need this information immediately. But yeah, if you can, 
you know, say, how about we only cover this much today and we'll come back, you know, in two days to do the rest? That would be good. All right. Um, what else did I want to say? Oh, quick. Colors of the rainbow. You can shout them out or put them in chat. Aha, Bella has already gotten us right to them by telling us about Roy G. Biv. So Roy G. Biv um, is a mnemonic device. It's not a good one actually, because usually the uh, acronym that you come up with, the shortcut that you come up with should be one that actually makes sense and you don't have to actually learn the mnemonic. You should be a word that you can recognize. But people now recognize Roy G. Biv as red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Um, mnemonics are another way to encode content. Mnemonics are memory tricks. They're groups of easy to remember letters, words, or images to help learners store and retrieve more complex material. These are some of the types of um, mnemonics, acronyms, acrostics, letter-based devices like the three A's of customer recovery, the ABCs of uh, creating a good learning objective, rhymes, keywords, uh, kinesthetic mnemonics. So things you can remember by, you know, how many, how many days in the months, you know, 31, 30, 31. So bodily kinesthetic mnemonics as well. Um, it's also a very good strategy to have learners create their own mnemonics rather than giving them some. So give them some content and say, you create an acronym for this. You create a rhyme for this. You know, you come up with a way to remember it. Um, and also to remember that this can often be very English centric. If you have an audience of non-English speakers, you may not be able to use some of these word and letter patterns with that audience. So just keep that in mind as well. Um, Mnemonics are sticky. <laughs> Michael's even proving that for us. Uh, Richard of York gained battle in vain. That's another way of remembering Joy Roy G. Biv. Other um, chat, any other mnemonic devices you've, you've learned or uh, used in your training? Somehow I'm not able to scroll through my chat right this moment but I hope you're typing in some mnemonic devices, which I cannot see. Ah, yes, for the musical scale that every good boy does fine. Um, yes, good, good point about that. Every good boy deserves fudge, does fine. Kings play chess, yes. So we can come up with some of these mnemonic devices even if we learn them as middle schoolers, I still remember one from biology class and I'm not even a science student. So um, these are very sticky ways of memory. Um, all right, with only three minutes left to go, um, we don't even have time for our putting it all together exercise. So we're gonna do a, a abbreviated version of that. We were going to do a think, pair, share exercise. That is where people think individually. And this was gonna be for a minute. Then you were going to share for pair in pairs, talk about it for four minutes, and then share. We're going to go directly to the share stage here um, because we have two minutes. Um, raise a hand or put in chat. What is something you learned or relearned tonight? Or what was the muddiest point? Or, and this was our learning objective, what did we talk about tonight that you can try in your next session with adult learners? So please raise a hand or put in chat. You do not need to answer all of these questions, but um, any, any thoughts on any of these questions? And Evan, Michael has a question for you, so you might wanna answer in chat. Ah, uh, there we go, yes. The reason, Evan, that I remember that is from middle school is because it was King Philip came over from Germany stoned, and that was just so funny for us in middle school. Aishna, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing your name right, I apologize, says give them, give them something to process the information. Michael says demonstrating. 
I can't read yours, Michael, because my chat is acting badly. Uh, I just was saying how well I thought you demonstrated at the beginning aspects of the learning approach versus telling. I, th I think you modeled that very, very well. So. Great, thank you. Um, yes, a couple of you are liking that. We're, we're interested in that pedagogy versus andragogy comparison and also just getting learners to create their own memory devices, their own acronyms, chunking and spacing, says Chantal. And welcome, Chantal. All right, everyone, thank you for that. Um, I think Renee is gonna just say a few quick words and then I will hang around if anyone does have any questions, but thank you all so, so much for being here. Renee? Yes, thank you, Sophie. Really quick, um, we do have a learning design certificate. Um, it is four courses. Um, this information Sophie went over uh, is taken from the first course, the learning design fundamentals, which actually starts in two weeks um, for the semester. Um, I have a QR code there that leads you to the website. I have our email. Um, I'm also going to send out information in a follow-up email tomorrow if you have any other questions. Um, but everyone who attended tonight, we are willing to offer you um, 10% discount on tuition for one course in one semester um, if you're interested in diving deeper into any of this information. All right, thank you for that. And um, as I said, again, um, really thank you for coming, for participating in my, my activities and chats. And um, I am here if you have any questions about the content we talked about and or about the certificate program. I have some students here, so I don't know if any of them want to hang around in case you have a question about the certificate program. But um, if you are leaving us here, thank you again for being here. I do have a uh, quote from Malcolm Knowles to, to end with uh, that we will learn no matter what. Learning is as natural as rest or play with or without books inspiring trainers or classrooms, we will manage to learn. Educators can, however, make a difference in what people learn and how well they learn it. If we know why we are learning and if the reason fits our needs as we perceive them, we will learn quickly and deeply. So with that, thank you. And um, what questions do you have? Let's see. <clears throat> so it looks like Michael asked if the courses are um, synchronous or they're live. They're all online synchronous. So just like this, you'll meet on Zoom at a specific day and time. Um, most of them are in the evening. We do have one uh, that takes place over a couple weekends. And they feel like they're super long and they can be super long at the end of a full work day. They're three and a half hours in the evening. But any of my students who are still on here, tell, tell us how fast that those three and a half hours go. <laughs> it does go fast. I'm shocked. It was, I didn't remember it being three and a half hours long. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, in my opinion and experience, what duration do I recommend for virtual instructor-led training? So there's there's so much to consider there. I mean, part of it is the nature of the content itself. I really like to analyze the content before I give a blanket answer to that. And there is some research about um, if you engage the learners every, I think it's less, less than five minutes, but every five minutes or so, and when I say engage them, I mean like really engage their minds, not engage them by saying press a button here or you know put something in chat, but really think about. I'm putting a question on the board, think about this. Go into a breakout room, talk about this. If you fully engage them, it can be longer. Um, if it's really information heavy, I've heard 20 minutes is a good estimate for the max. So it really depends on the content and how engaging you can make that content. How often are there breaks in that 3.5 hour class? James, I have I have adjusted that according to what people want. Um, usually I do two 15 minute breaks. I was just saying, because we were just talking about how you needed to have the breaks in between. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I, so it's really interesting because 
what we're talking about in these classes is adult learning in the workplace primarily. It is different in an academic setting. I mean, we give grades in these courses and you don't, don't often give grades in a workplace setting unless of course it's a certification type of program, that sort of thing. So there are some things we say and don't do. And that is, uh, I do usually call that out as you know, call attention to that, that there are some things we're recommending in learning fundamentals that we do not do in the certificate program because it's an academic institution and it's a little different. Oh, I have a long question here. Let me just try and open this chat better. Uh, I design trainings and closing training team. Resources are quizzes that can help trainers identify their strengths or facilitation styles. That is interesting. Nothing is popping to mind. I do think I have been exposed to some of those in the past and they're just, I'm not remembering what they are, but please um, reach out to me by email or on LinkedIn or somewhere else so that if I do find that and remember where it was, I can get that information to you. Sorry about that. Michael. Sophie, I had, a, I had a question if it's okay. I thought the, um, you know, this idea of, uh, of, of, of demonstrating versus telling, you know, uh, it was, was an excellent insight. And I wonder if there was a resource you could suggest, you know, something that would help us audit our own trainings or, or suggest how to get there, you know what I mean? Because I think it's it's instinctive for many of us just to, I mean, to lecture, it, you know, certainly to engage people, but it may still not be doing this demonstrate versus tell, you know. So there is actually a great book called Telling Ain't Training. Um, and it's it's written at a very simple level. It is not a textbook. It is a it's an easy reading book, but it has a lot of, of starter ideas and ideas. And, and it really I mean, based on its title, you can tell that that's what it's about. Telling Ain't Training by I'm just trying to see if I can see it on my shelf, but I'm not a uh, Harold. Somebody. Yeah, don't know. Try that. Harold Stolovich. Yes. Stolovich. Yep. yep, got it. And be careful because one is telling ain't training. Another one is something ain't performing. So just make sure you're looking at the one that's about telling and training. Okay, cool. Anybody else? I may have missed some questions in the chat. Oh, Helene, are you still here? Uh, in a customer service role, advice for briefly teaching that efficient. Yeah, I mean, customer service people really are great audiences for these little chunks of information when they need it. So, you know, what what kind of training? So again, we also talk about training in these classes as a lot more broad than just formal workshop learning trainings. We talk about designing training experiences and informal learning opportunities, such as job aids. You know, so customer service people, maybe you don't even have them do a long involved training program. Maybe there's a thing on their desk with dividers and, and um, you know, flip, flip to the right question when it comes up type of thing. So just in time type of training. Um, I have a lot more to say about that, but it's getting late in the evening and some of you are hanging around. So hopefully that's enough to start. <laughs> 